Well, Pastor Stan had a plan. You ever have a plan? His plan did not include AIDS orphans in Africa. How many of you know sometimes it's good to have your plans changed? There was a conference that he went to where he heard Bono get interviewed. Anybody like Bono? All right, three of you. He sold some records. <laughs> He heard Bono get interviewed at Willow Creek Leadership Conference, and his heart was burdened. What could Christian Life Center do, he prayed. So he prayed about it, and he felt compelled by the Spirit to develop a strategy centered around the local church. His church would raise the funds to build a church building, a pastor's home, widow's homes, where the 20% of AIDS orphans in the country of Swaziland, or now Eswatini, those villages could be cared for. It included child sponsorship. It included the whole church packing and sending food, uh, grants to start businesses, and a solar-powered water well for clean water. They wanted to see a church-centric model for holistic transformation. So they sent a vision team. Uh, and en route, they got this text message. Make sure you meet up with Kevin Ward, read the text, a strategic thinker in Swaziland. Now, everyone laughed when they saw that text when they arrived in Berlin in their, in their uh, you know, in between the planes, because how in the world would they ever be connected to a single individual in a whole country? So they landed, and then they just kept hitting wall after wall after wall in the country. Finally, they're at a dinner uh, where a guy stands up and starts to cast a vision that he believed God had given to him for holistic transformation. Pastor Stan stood up on his feet and said, that's what I'm talking about. How many of you know that when the Holy Spirit changes your plans, he's always going to help you get there? I want to show you a picture of Pastor Stan and Joyce. Christian Life Center has now seen 33 out of the original goal of 60 villages in Eswatini transformed by this spirit-led vision. To be spirit-led, sometimes you have to go with those Holy Spirit changes of plans. And this is just one of the projects that they have taken on in their God-sized vision, which focuses on the categories of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Anybody recognize those phrases? We talked about those a couple weeks ago. Last year, that single church was able to give $2.5 million to the God Size Vision Fund. I want to show you a video just of this past year of some of the kids whose lives have been transformed by this church's willingness to have their plans changed. We're in a series, and this is the fifth week, that we're talking about being led by the Spirit. And I want to welcome you to Mesa Church. My name is Jordan Hansen, and I have the distinct privilege of serving uh, in this church as the lead pastor. I uh, want to thank you for tuning in online. We are so grateful that uh, you're willing to hang out with us a little bit on your Sunday morning, and we pray that you will be challenged by today's message. Well, I've titled this message, Change of Plans, surprise, surprise, because that's what we're going to be talking about. How do you respond when the Holy Spirit changes the plans? What does it mean to be led by the Spirit when the Spirit wants to change our plans? And I'm going to tell you, I'm the type of guy who likes to have a plan. You know what I'm talking about? I, I want to know what's happening. How do you respond? Can we, and here's a real question, can we legitimately be a follower of Jesus if we are unwilling to be led by the 
Spirit. We've been talking about this for five weeks now. What does that mean, to be led by the Spirit? God always has a reason, even if we are left to view it through the clearer vision of looking back at all that God has done. We don't always know why at first, but when we are lovingly obedient to the call of God on our lives, he will work out everything for our good and for his glory. After all, Jesus doesn't call himself Lord of the harvest for nothing. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. I, I'm really excited to preach on a passage that doesn't get preached a lot. You might have heard it before. But it has everything to do with the change of plans that God initiated in Paul's journey, in his second missionary journey. The book of Acts is written by, not Paul, but actually by a guy by the name of Luke, who is likely of Gentile background and who records much of the early church's history from his own eyewitness testimony. I want to go ahead and read Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10, as we think about that question. What do we do when God changes our plans? At least ask our opinion, Lord. All right, let's... This one might be one of those messages where we need to stop and pray before the Word of God sinks deep into our heart. Lord, we are open to your Word. We want you to be Lord of our lives. So help us to be led by the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. This is what Acts chapter 16 says in verse 6. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because... Listen to this. The Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. I want you to let that phrase sink into your hearts. Why would God prevent the preaching of the gospel in Asia? it almost sounds like it doesn't belong in his book, doesn't it? I mean, just being honest, it's a really interesting and strange phrase. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. Bithynia is the area where modern-day Istanbul is. Constantinople hadn't been invented yet. That was hundreds of years later by, Con uh, by uh, Constantine, and then Constantinople was eventually, its name was changed to Istanbul. So I had the pleasure of going to Turkey last year, and I got to see a lot, of, a lot of these regions with my own eyes. But again, I want you to underline this, the second time the Holy Spirit blocks Paul, but again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So Paul wanted to go to this area where modern day Istanbul is. There's a port there. It's a big metropolitan area it totally flows with his strategy to go to these big cities to preach the gospel and to see the church planted and then multiplied from there but for some reason the holy spirit referenced the second time as the spirit of jesus hello trinity <laughs> that there is a reason why he is preventing paul from going there so instead they went through mysia to the seaport of troas that night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with them, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we, I want you to take your pen and circle that word we. It's probably the most significant plural pronoun that you will read in the entire New Testament. And I'm going to tell you why. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once and having concluded that God was calling us, go ahead and circle us, we and us, why is the pronoun changing here? To preach the good news there. Wow. I want to talk about the changes that God sometimes sovereignly orchestrates in our lives. The first one I want to talk about is when God says no. Have you ever prayed, and you've prayed, and you've prayed, and God says, did you know that God is allowed to say, 
Did you know that? <laughs> I don't like it any more than you do. I do not like hearing a no, but that's exactly what Paul gets. The Holy Spirit prevents them from preaching the word in the province, province of Asia at that time. Then the Holy Spirit did not allow them to go up to Bithynia, which is modern day, again, Northwest Asia Minor, or Turkey. They ended up in a place called Tras, Tro, Troas, which is a very important place because the book of Acts was written by a guy by the name of Luke. And up until this verse, it was always they did that, they went there, they did that, they went there. But in this verse, it says we. Now, you don't get a full description or an explanation of how that first meeting, maybe second meeting, we don't know if there's a previous relationship, but we do know that based on the writer of the book of Acts, who also wrote, wrote Luke and Acts in one volume, somehow connected with Paul and his companions in the city that Paul went to when God said, no, not to Bithynia, not to Asia. And so they decided to go to Troas. Now you'll read of the we and the us pronoun in Acts 16, verses 10, 11, 12, 16, 19, 40. You'll read it in 20, verse 5, 21, verse 1, 21, verse 10, 27, verse 1, and 27, verse 2. In other words, Luke accompanies Paul on and off for the rest of his journeys. Now, I want you to understand why this is so significant. If I were to ask you who wrote the majority of the New Testament, oftentimes we are conditioned to think because of all of the books that Paul wrote that Paul was the most prolific author of the New Testament. It might surprise you that Luke wrote more of the New Testament than even Paul did by word count, okay? Just because I'm a nerd, I'm going to tell you what the word count is. <laughs> Luke wrote only two books. Out of 37, it accounted for, uh, for 27.5% of the New Testament. 37,000 words, 37,932 words. Paul, who wrote 13 of the 27 books, um, wrote only 23.5%. So not by a lot, but, but by more. Paul wrote about 32,408 words. And i got to be honest with you, I enjoy reading Luke a little more than I enjoy reading Paul. I'll just be, be clear. But there were other contributors like John and Matthew and Mark and Peter and Matthew and Mark and James and Jude and, and whoever the author of Hebrews is. The point is, the author of Luke was a significant meeting. And Paul meets, Paul meets Luke in the city of Troas. When God says no, there's always a reason and when you have prayed when you've asked the lord and when you are believing for something specific to happen and in god's sovereignty the answer is no i know it sounds cliche to say this but there is always a reason here's the part that's not so cliche the truth is we may never know why god says no we may never know but when God says no, there is always a reason. The second thing I want to look at in this passage is when God says go. When he changes our plans by saying no, and when he changes our plans by saying go. What does that look like? Well, in Troas, Paul receives a vision of the Macedonian man. And again, Jesus calls himself the Lord of the harvest in Matthew 9, 37 through 38. And it's one of the qualifications, in my opinion, to being a Christian, much less someone who has chosen to follow God wherever they are called. God has a calling on your life. In fact, the book of Acts says that he has appointed times and dates and he has purpose for you in the places and in the people that you are relating to. And Paul heard the words of God in his vision, go. And there were three communities in Macedonia that, that Paul impacted. The community of Philippi, anybody heard of the, the book Philippians? This was the first city that Paul 
preaches, and on the Sabbath outside the city by a river, he meets a woman by the name of Lydia, a worshiper of God. They cast a demon out later in that city. They get enslaved, and eventually they get released, and then they move on to Thessalonica. Anyone heard of the city or the book uh, Thessalonians? So now we've got Philippians, we've got Thessalonians, all in the area of Macedonia, right? All because God said no, and then God said go to this place instead. And then finally, we have a city called Berea. Berea doesn't have a book, or at least that we know of, but Paul and Silas find a receptive audience there amongst the Jews, and it says that the Bereans search the scriptures daily to verify Paul's teachings. If anyone ever calls you a Berean, it is a positive thing. It means that you want to search the scriptures for yourself, and you want to evaluate what the Holy Spirit is saying through, through the scriptures, and you don't take anything... Um, just because uh, someone said it. You know who I love is a Berean in this church? Jesus. I don't know where Jesus is, but Jesus is a Berean. Where are you? Yes. Every time I talk to Jesus, he's like, well, let's look at Scripture. Let's think about Scripture. Like, Jesus is a Berean. He just didn't know that he's from Berea. <laughs> Eventually, the Jews from Thessalonica oppose them. They have to part for Athens, and they leave Silas and Timothy behind. And the point of all of this is God had a reason for his no, he had a reason for his go, and Paul was just open to whatever the Lord has. Have you ever heard of the name Edward Kimball? I, I want to actually see if there's anybody here that has ever heard the name Edward Kimball. Anybody? Edward Kimball was one of, and is one of my heroes because he was a Sunday school teacher who believed that God wanted to reach every single young person in the Sunday school class that he taught. He believed that God had a calling on his life to go and to, to teach and to help these young boys understand who Jesus is. I love Edward Kimball because there are a lot of people who give their lives to kids' ministries, and you will never know the impact of your go. Some of you will never, ever know the impact of your go until Jesus shows you who you reached. You see, Edward Kimball felt em empowered one day to go to the cobbler's shoe store to talk to the apprentice who was in his Sunday school class. His name was Dwight L. Moody. Maybe you've heard of him, but the story doesn't end there. And because of a Holy Spirit-led, impassioned speech about Jesus. Finally, D.L. Moody figured it out and gave his heart to Christ. D.L. Moody would grow up to start an evangelism circuit and mentor young people. A man by the name of Wilbur Chapman was converted under his preaching. And under the preaching of Wilbur Chapman was a guy by the name of Billy Sunday who was converted under his preaching, as well as another student by the name of Mordecai Ham. Does anybody know the name Mordecai Ham? Mordecai Ham also was converted under the preaching of Wilbur Chapman. And God had called him to preach in a small town. Back then it was a lot smaller than it is today. The city of Charlotte. And he was preaching and preaching and confronting and preaching the gospel and calling people to repentance. And in fact, it was common for him to sort of try to create a little controversy in the city. And so he would drive a hearse through the city and invite people to come listen to the word of God preached. Now, again, I don't know where that would fit in today's world of <laughs> trying to get people to show up. But finally, he did. A young man by the name of Billy Graham. And it was because of the preaching of Mordecai Ham that this card was filled out on November 1st, 1934. And you can read the words, Billy Graham. Now you probably know who Billy Graham is because he grew up to be a famous evangelist and preached to millions and millions and millions. Mentoring Greg Laurie, mentoring Rick Warren, mentoring many of today's leaders. 
and had an incredibly successful career. There's always a reason. When God says no, when God says go, there is always a reason. But what about the next one? When God says grow. I don't like no. I kind of like go, but I don't really like change, so it's okay. But let me tell you the one I really don't like, grow. <laughs> I really don't like grow. I want to read you guys a story. At the age of 14, I naively prayed an innocent prayer. Don't pray this prayer unless you mean it. Lord, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything, as long as I know it is really you. Friends, that is like the prayer for patience, okay? He doesn't give you patience. He gives you toddlers. <laughs> so after graduating college and having worked in Alaska and the Yukon as a tour director for All in America, I flew to Hawaii and did a discipleship training school under former YWAM missionaries who are now actually also based in Huntington Beach. Tom and Cindy Bauer and Surfing the Nations, if you've ever heard of them. By the way, trying to fundraise for Surfing the Nations was very difficult. I wonder why. <laughs> and then I did an internship as a response team member with Book of Hope, now One Hope, a child evangelistic ministry based out of Fort Lauderdale. It was there that I developed a mentoring relationship with Randy Young, a former pastor who caught the fire for missions pastoring in Cleveland, Ohio, where God brought 35 different nationalities and nations to his single church. Isn't that awesome? And I've known Randy for the last 20 years. And one thing about Randy is that when he calls me and says he's been praying for me, I believe him. When he calls me and says, I have a word for you, I believe you should pray about this word, I believe him and I pray about that. So when Randy called me at the end of my sabbatical, I took the call, and he asked me the question, how settled in Southern California are you? And I said, as settled as you can be. I'm still on sabbatical, but I'm rested, I'm refreshed, and I'm ready to go. We have our rhythm, we are comfortable. Also, never tell God you're comfortable. That's another point. <laughs> Tara has had so much favor in her career. We own our house. What more could I want? Why? What's up? Well, I have a pastor friend who's looking for his successor, and I felt like the Lord. Put you in my heart. He didn't put anyone else. Now, truth be told, I have made a commitment always to take calls like this. It is my belief, my firm belief, that for that innocent prayer that I prayed as a 14-year-old to be true, I must take calls like this in order to give God a chance to speak and for me to discern what he is saying. I'm still asking him to send me to the Bahamas. This was the third call like this I've taken in the past few years, and I've never heard God speak through one of them. But to be clear, I was not looking, nor was I pursuing anything with anyone anywhere. Okay, Randy, I'll take the call, but just know that I'm not thinking about this for myself, but I will be thinking of people I know, and maybe I can give you a name of someone who is looking. But give me a couple weeks to get back into my church and focus on where I know that God has placed me. So about a month later, he put me on a Zoom call with the pastor. And while I had a plan for that call, my plans were jolted by a few things that took me by surprise. I was surprised by four things. The first was his academic background. He had a Bible degree, a dual major in business. He had a master's in counseling. He had a master's in business, and he had a doctorate in conflict resolution. I thought to myself, who is this guy? I don't know leaders with that much background much less pastors and it piqued my curiosity my own academic background is in my undergrad is in business with a minor in bible and a concentration in nonprofit. And my master's degree in divinity is 
really mostly focused in missiology because of an exchange program that I basically created with Asia Pacific Theological Seminary while I was there. The second thing that caught me off guard was the succession plan and the way that he talked about it. It had been a 10-year journey. They had gone to a Dallas conference about 10 years ago, and they had been coached in the 12 milestones of successful succession, and about three years ago had hired a search firm who did a nine-month search and produced three candidates, and for the first time in their history as a church, they had rejected all three candidates. So the pastor punted. The church applauded, and he said he'd find his successor. Now, this guy has been at this church for 40 years, so a long time. So last summer, he took out 20 of his closest friends and asked them to give him one name who he could interview, and Randy Young gave him my name. Third thing that I was shocked by was the longevity and the growth that he had seen under his 40-year tenure. Seven as an executive pastor, 33 years as the lead, he had gone through some tough, tough times, multiple building projects, but had seen the church grow from 1,000 to over 2,500. The thing that caught me off guard also was that after finding his successor, that he would go on a sabbatical and then return to the life of the church. The fourth thing that caught me off guard was the focus of this church on missions. I was especially moved by the church's vision for missions where they had given two and a half million dollars to their God-sized vision split into four categories, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth last year alone. I was shocked to hear that the name of the person who had texted Pastor Stan on that very first Swaziland vision trip to meet Kevin Ward was Randy Young. Same Randy Young who had given Stan my name. What was I supposed to think about that? God, what are you trying to say to me? As you can tell by the end of the Zoom conversation, my emotions were kind of discombobulated. When he asked me what Tara did and I responded, pediatric nurse, he said, so is my wife. Oh, and this church is in Dayton, Ohio. Yes, where it is cold and snowing right now. <laughs> but also about an hour north of where my biological brother pastors, and an hour and a half east of where Tara's other older brother lives. And these last two could be good or bad, just depending. <laughs> Tim is a very large human, I believe descended from the Nephilim of the Old Testament. <laughs> and he could crush me. <laughs> I later found out, trying to do some research, that one of Tara's very best friends, a person we all know and love because she was our worship pastor, that Hunter and Bree Tomlinson and their two sweet babies were planning on eventually moving back to her hometown, Dayton, Ohio. God, what are you trying to say to me? I had my plans. So Pastor Stan texted me to come preach with dates, and I did not sense the Holy Spirit wanted me to do that. Instead, I heard a very clear direction from the Holy Spirit, and I felt like God said, you need to spend time with Stan and Joyce to even know if this is a possibility, because they plan on coming back to the church, being in the church, finding a place in the church, and serving. So we did. Now, when I first started dating Tara, she requested of me that I would meet her dad. And we were still early on in our journey together. And being a typical guy, I was definitely afraid of commitment. And I said, if we have to buy a ticket so that I can meet your dad, does that mean that you and I are still going to be together in four months? And she looked at me and said, well, that's the plan, isn't it? <laughs> so I bought the ticket. And she's been bossing me around ever since. <laughs> I kid. I'm the head. She's the neck. I definitely wear the pants in the family, but she picks them out. <laughs> but after meeting Paul and spending a week with him, I literally said to Tara, 
I would marry you just to be his son-in-law. You would think that a compliment like that would make her upset, but it made her happy. At the end of that first trip, Pastor Stan and Joyce, after having interviewed all of the other 19 people, and some of them came out and preached, and they spent time with them, asked Tara and I to pray about being willing to engage in the next phase of this evaluation process as the sole potential candidates, which put a lot of pressure on us, since at this point I was still catching my breath to where the process really was. After more prayer, we consented to the next phase, there were two two-hour Zoom combos with about 25 people, the board, the advisory board, the succession team, and their spouses. And they came to a unanimous de decision for in-person interviews in which we flew out and endured two, endured two and a half days of interviews. By the way, the process that Mesa has is very similar. You would think that you are interviewing the personal bodyguard of the President of the United States. After that trip, there was another unanimous vote to make us the next lead pastors of Christian Life Center pending a trip to preach to all three services and a congregational vote. And that vote took place this last week, weekend. With an overwhelming vote of 99%. My last days, your pastor will be five. Weeks from today, March 10th, Mesa Church, what in the world would cause me to leave SoCal weather, the Pacific Ocean, in and out my wife's career, leave the people that we love in our community, where we have dedicated our three babies, where we have experienced your love and your support, your encouragement, and your belief in us. We are not leaving because we are dissatisfied or that we don't believe in Mesa. In fact, last week, Mesa ran out of parking spots. Mesa has never felt more spirit-led, unified, healthy, and mission-motivated. Do we have any, anything? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we don't follow family, friends, or the weather, or even opportunity. We, like you, try our best to be led by the Spirit. And we believe we are being led by the Spirit to a new role with new responsibilities in God's kingdom where there is snow. We deeply love you and will forever be changed by your grace, loyalty, and especially your love for Jesus and for us. My prayer is that you will always consider us Mesa Church family and that we can come back and visit to celebrate all that God has done and to thank him who has been so faithful, so incredibly faithful. We recognize that there are lots of questions, and without trying to answer all of those questions right now, we want to give you space to process this news. So I'm going to slip out and go be with my family, and I, as well as the amazing Mesa Church elders, will be back here on this Tuesday night to pray with you, to answer questions that you may have, and to give the interim plan and vision for the days ahead. When God says grow, it is often for us one of the points of conversation that I asked the Lord about was why did you lead me to take a sabbatical if you knew this was going to happen? And he reminded me that that sabbatical was not just for me, but it was for this church to be reminded that Jesus Christ is the head, that he will always be the head, and he will always be here 
to guide each of us on the journey of following him. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. And friends, if we love God, it will be good in his time and in his way. Mesa Church has always had the same lead pastor, and his name is Jesus. And he has reminded me that as much as I love you, he loves you so much more than I will ever be capable of loving. I'd like to invite Randy Martinez, our chairperson pro tem, and the leader of the elder board to come and to pray us out today. Thank you, everybody. I always had a problem finding mics. I can drop them, but can't find them. Um, Randy Martinez, um, chair of the Elder Board currently, and we humbly serve you. All of your elders humbly serve you. We love this church. We've loved Jordan and Tara. We have dealt with this for a few weeks now, um, knowing, but we have faith in our Lord. We have faith in Christ, and we know this is the Holy Spirit moving on this church and stirring something tremendous and hopeful and something that we don't even know yet. I'll get into that a little bit later, but I'd like to pray and in this prayer, I just feel let's stand together before our Lord. Let's pray together before God. Father in heaven, you are mighty and great. All glory to God. We lift you up. Yeah, we trust you. We worship you. We Praise you, God. You're mighty. Holy Spirit, you are comforting. You are our guide. Lord, we don't know. We have questions. We don't know exactly what's happening, always. But we have faith that you do. And I stand firm on your word today, God, that says we don't belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed but we belong to those. We are your church that is saved through faith. And it's that faith that we have in you that we can trust in because you have this all worked out. Lord, I pray for Jordan and Tara. I thank you for their time here with us because I firmly believe God that without his leadership, without his love for people, without their demonstration of courage and faith and concern, without his wisdom, we don't know how, where our church would have been through the transitions we've had over the past five, six years. But here we are, God, in a place that you gave to us, a home, a sanctuary, a place that new people are coming to all the time. And we know that this building represents your arms and your home and your table for which everybody can come to and there is room for all of us here. We thank you, Jesus, for your graciousness, for your goodness, for your mighty acts, for your love. Oh, Lord, I want to just be in your presence right now knowing that through your Holy Spirit, we are all strengthened, we are all comforted, and we are 
all motivated to move ahead. We support Jordan and Tara, Lord. We love them. And we know that you have their life in your hands. And we see this, Lord, as an extension of our ministry here at Mesa to move towards the east. Jordan will always be part of us. We love him. We love Tara. We love those children. We pray for them. You keep them, Lord. You use them in a mighty way. And I pray that you use each pastor, staff member, and person in this church to continue to meet the needs of this dynamic place where people have loved each other so much and will continue to do so. We pray this by the name of Jesus and by the blood of Christ we have come to you, loving you and knowing you. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Yeah, thank you, Lord, for all you've done. In Jesus' name we pray.
until he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand everybody just love you all appreciate you let's have a seat together just want to draw you to some next steps as we're here together. And um, excuse me, I need to remove my glasses so I can read. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask the ushers to come forward now for um, one more opportunity to give as they begin to um, disperse the buckets throughout the auditorium but here's another opportunity for you to worship the Lord with tithes and offerings and gifts very much appreciated and while they're doing that may I ask all of our elders who are present to just come up on the platform for a moment on either side of me and while they're coming just some announcements for what's happening here at Mesa next week, um, next Sunday at um, 2 o'clock, um, February 11th, is a big game. You're all invited to watch it on the big screen, okay? There's going to be a chili bowl, our annual chili bowl. So if you're wanting to compete, if you make the best chili on the block, bring it. It'll be there. Um, set it up and see if you will win. And I just trust all of you are 49ers fans for that game, right? <laughs> the Lord didn't tell me to say that, but I thought we would. Next week, 2 p.m. here. And then um, February 13th, Tuesday evening, 6 o'clock to 9 p.m. is our parents' night out. There is child care provided here at the church for that. Um, if you're a parent, you want um, just uh, some time away, away from your kids so you can talk about them all night, come drop them here at the church and then go out and have a nice time together. That's, again, February 13th, 6 o'clock to 9 p.m. And then lastly, this Tuesday, February 6th, this is our first Tuesday night prayer and worship night, which is always going to be the first Tuesday night of the month. At this first one, we are going to have um, a question and answer session with Jordan. Jordan will be here. The elder boards will be here, and we will be there ready to answer questions about this transition time, about our next steps as a board and as pool pick committees and so forth. So please come out, listen to more of Jordan. Jordan's heart on this, and um, we will also have more Q&A for you at that time, and, and you'll get some more clarity on the process. I wanted to bring up our board because I wanted you to see each of them. I know you know, a lot of you know them, but we're going to be here after service. Just we'll disperse around the platform up here. Come up, ask us questions, talk to us. We'll pray with you if you'd like us to, and we're here for you for the next few moments. We love you, Mesa Church, and we're here for you. We humbly serve you, and we want to move ahead, and we know God has a plan. So love you. Have a great week this week.